All right, class, welcome to chapter one of molecular biology. Um, in these PowerPoint or, uh, videos that I am going to post, we'll have a table of contents at the beginning here that will kind of orient you uh, as to what we'll talk about within this chapter. Uh, so here we're talking about the molecules of life, uh, prokaryote and eukaryotic cell structure, um, model organisms for eukaryotes, uh, and then metazoan structure differentiation and model organisms. Okay, so <clears throat> when we talk about biological systems, we know that they all have the same experience, right? So they all follow the same rules of chemistry and physics that we find here on Earth. <clears throat> You've heard the term uh, carbon-based life forms in your sci-fi movies or in space biology or exobiology um, because all organisms are carbon-based. Um, and so they've evolved though to take advantage of these different niches or different environmental conditions uh, through pressures of natural selection over billions of years. So even though these organisms are highly diverged, so the difference between you, a human, and a protozoa or a yeast cell or a bird for that matter, um, they seem very big. These differences um, as the result of evolution still maintain some uh, common uh, chemical and molecular mechanisms and pathways between us and very more uh, basic, so to speak, species. Um, and so because of this, these similarities across these biological systems uh, make the use of model organisms very important for understanding uh, how um, biology works. So for instance, um, I teach developmental biology uh, once a year. And if you are studying development, it's very uh, counterintuitive or not ethically uh, a good idea to experiment on human fetuses because obviously that's going to be a baby and there's uh, some ethical considerations as to whether that's a person or not. However, we can learn a lot about development from the study of model organisms such as things like uh, Xenopus, which is the frog, or mice, um, and or Drosophila is another big one. Um, and because these uh, there's this conservation of these characteristics across all organisms, we can learn things from these models to apply to uh, higher organisms such as humans. So all orga uh, living organisms uh, descended from a common uh, ancestor. And so this is the basis of evolution. Um, and here we see the family tree or a uh, evolutionary tree or a dendrogram uh, showing the different domains and so we have uh, bacteria, we have archaea, and we have eukaryotes. And so here, uh, this green square is showing the uh, last uh, common ancestor uh, of, extant, of extant or uh, living species. <clears throat> and from there, uh, the bacteria were first to uh, branch off, then the archaea, and lastly, the eukaryotes. And um, along this tree, though, um, these branches are the product of uh, evolutionary processes like gene duplications and mutations, uh, and a combination of duplication and mutation to the duplicated gene, etc., um, as well as the loss of genes through um, natural selection and, and uh, no use anymore. Um, and also what's interesting with on here, in the eukaryotes, uh, we know that there are organelles, right? <clears throat> and so uh, both mitochondria and chloroplasts for plants were originally bacteria that were taken up through uh, endocytosis into eukaryotic cells. And over time, those bacteria that were the predecessors of mitochondria and chloroplast, they lost the ability to live on their own. So they lost all the genes that um, are required for uh, life as an individual and instead relied on the cells that uh, took them up. So if we were to look at mitochondria and chloroplasts, they both have their own genomes that are largely containing genes that are responsible for uh, their reproduction. Um, and But they've lost all the ability to, for instance, um, conduct uh, metabolize sugar uh, and things like that. Instead, 
um, they rely on you know protection and a lot of um, uh, stress response and things like that from their host cells. So if we were to look at a timeline of evolution uh, on Earth based on the fossil record, we can see that um, organisms such as uh, cyanobacteria, which are the first uh, photosynthesizing bacteria, occurred uh, 3,000 million years ago. Um, and eukaryotes appeared uh, about uh, 1850 million years ago. And it wasn't until uh, about two million years ago, where the first uh, genus from the genus Homo, so Homo sapiens, uh, appeared in the fossil record. So, uh, and before that, if we were to look at just mammals in general, that's not uh, occurred only uh, 215 million years ago. So, as you can see, single celled organisms were the first to evolve with multicellular organisms and higher organisms, as we like to call them, uh, like humans and primates and things of that nature. Uh, evolving much later from common ancestors um, that were single-celled organisms that, that uh, arose much earlier uh, in the evolutionary timeline. So if we were to look at this at a cellular, cellular level, cells come in a big assortment of shapes and sizes. Um, we have uh, very small cells, um, such as bacteria, um, and we have uh, within the human body, uh, red blood cells and white blood cells. Um, and they all share common features. So all cells have DNA, they all have a plasma membrane, um, but they differ in morphology and so shape. So if you look at this uh, neuron here or dendritic arbor, you see that comparing that to a bacteria, uh, single cell bacteria that is uh, uh, spherical or, or rod shaped in the first slide, um, the organization is different. And so uh, in addition to morphology, their ability to move, whether they're ciliated or have a flagella, um, differ between uh, uh, different single celled organisms or single cells. Um, their internal organization, so if you're prokaryotic um, or eukaryotic, eukaryotes have a nucleus that contain uh, the DNA, while pro prokaryotes, uh, prokaryotes uh, do not, um, as well as their metabolic activities. So there's um, photosynthesizing cells, plant cells, and photosynthesizing cyanobacteria. Um, and then there are cells that do not do that. Um, so there's a lot of differences. There's commonalities uh, with the DNA and the plasma membrane and the basics of life, but there's a lot of differences between these different cells as well. So in multicellular organisms, we have tissues, which are made of uh, closely interrelated elements of multiple cell types. So in our example here, we have skin tissue. And skin is a living organism composed of a protective outer layer. And these are actually, I say a living tissue. Uh, the protective outer layer is actually dead skin cells, so they're not reproducing anymore and, and have kind of lost their uh, cellular functions. Um, underneath that, we have epidermal cells, um, which are the cells that reproduce and give rise to the dead skin cells and kind of work in this inward to outward manner. Um, and then below that, we have this loose connective tissue um, that uh, connects the skin to deeper layers such as muscle. Um, and what attaches these different uh, cell types is uh, these desmosomes and hemidesmosomes. Those will attach one cell or uh, tissue type to another, but then in between cells, we have cell adhesion proteins that will connect two similar cell types to one another. So as we talked about earlier, um, a lot of cells share the molecular mechanisms and molecular constituents um, throughout the, the tree of life. And so there's a lot of cell molecules that are found um, across all these different domains. Um, and cells, we know cells are mostly composed of water, um, but there's also <clears throat> small inorganic ions and organ organic molecules that make up these cells. And so <clears throat> if we were to look at the constituents of these cells, 
we had noticed um, some interesting facts, and that is that um, only the L uh, stereoisomer, if you take an organic, uh, you learn stereoisomers, uh, the L stereoisomer uh, of amino acids and the D stereoisomer of glucose are used in cells. And so this is the result of evolution where uh, the L amino acids and the D um, sugars like glucose uh, were utilized in uh, the first very early cells and then all the cells that evolved from that continued to use those and there is never the evolution of an alternative mechanism that uses the alternative stereoisomer. So in terms of energy, energy usage and storage, uh, adenosine triphosphate or ATP is the most common molecule used by cells to capture, uh, store, and transfer energy. Um, this is universally conserved um, and it stores chemical uh, energy for future work within the cell. Um, and this energy is stored through um, two energy rich uh, phospho and hydride bonds, which are these bonds right here, the oxygen in between the two phosphates. Um, and photosynthesis in plants harvest sunlight and convert. ADP with the use of sunlight or light compounds in photosynthesis into ATP by adding that uh, phosphate. And then when that energy needs to be used for cellular processes, whether it's for construction of membrane or stress response or whatever process that needs energy input, then ATP is converted back to ADP in a phosphate group, which breaks that high energy bond and then allows uh, energy to be put into uh, all these examples at the bottom where we have synthesis of uh, cellular micromolecules, um, cell movements, so uh, cilia and flagella um, based movements or movements within the cell, um, such as utilizing motor proteins on the, uh, on the cytoskeleton to move different uh, uh, cellular elements around, um, uh, transport of molecules against a concentra uh, concentration gradient, whether that be uh, something like a sodium, a sodium ion pump across the plasma membrane, uh, generation of electric potential, uh, for example, in neurons, um, generation of heat in organisms that are uh, multicellular organisms that are cold. You have that shivering complex that generates uh, heat um, for to maintain a core body temperature, etc. So I really like this slide. This is a slide showing um, models for some of the representation of constituents of the cell. And so these are all drawn to a similar scale so you can see the relative size of some of these um, to one another. Um, a lot of times you hear of proteins and interacting with DNA or RNA or constituents of the uh, phospholipid bilayer, et cetera, um, but you don't really get a good perspective of the size of these things. And so here we have uh, the size of a DNA molecule. Obviously, this continues to extend um, in both directions. Uh, similarly with RNA, um, can continue to extend. Um, but we have uh, a large protein like uh, glutamine synthetase, um, which you can see is much larger than DNA. Um, but then you have other molecular uh, or uh, proteins such as insulin, uh, hemoglobin, uh, immunoglobulin uh, that are, and then uh, adenylate kinase as well, um, proteins that are much smaller. Um, and all of this is also, you can kind of put into perspective of the thickness uh, of a section of the phospholipid bilayer. Um, as you can see, it's kind of, uh, that's the outer portion, and then I probably should choose a color other than red because it's hard to see, um, but we have the outer portion here, and then the inner portion, and then uh, the uh, hydrophobic tails would be on the inside there. Um, and certain small molecules uh, can be linked to form polymers, um, such as sugars and polysaccharides, uh, amino acids and proteins, so all these proteins are made up of long chains of amino acids, uh, nucleotides, which make up 
both uh, DNA and RNA, um, etc. So uh, most of you have taken genetics uh, or cell biology, but we're going to do um, a very quick overview of DNA. And so DNA consists of two complementary strands that are, round, are wound around each other in a double helix. Um, these two strands are held together by weak hydrogen bonds between, uh, let's draw it up here, A and T, uh, which has two hydrogen bonds between those pairs, and then G and C, which has three hydrogen bonds between the two pairs. Um, and then during replication, uh, the strands unwind where we have um, uh, helicase and gyrase uh, enzymes coming in to unwind the uh, two strands. And then we have the transcription uh, machinery, uh, polymerase, um, as well as uh, stabilizing proteins, uh, single strand binding proteins, etc. Um, if you want a, a, a reminder or refresher on um, the mechanisms of DNA replication, uh, on my YouTube page, um, I have my genetics lectures, and you can go access uh, a lecture on DNA replication in much more detail. So we're just going to gloss over it right here. Um, but the end product of this is two identical strands uh, of the original uh, template. And uh, this genetic information along this DNA is encoded in a uh, linear order of bases along one strand. So um, the sequence of AGTC um, is the information conserved, for instance, in this region in a linear order along the DNA. Now a quick reminder on the central dogma of uh, life, <laughs> uh, DNA transcription uh, and translation. And so first we have our DNA where we have a transcription factor and a polymerase come in. Uh, in this case, RNA polymerase will transcribe the gene into RNA, or in this case, pre-RNA, because we're talking about eukaryotes. Remember in prokaryotes, there's no introns, um, so you just make RNA. In eukaryotes, there are intronic regions, which are non-coding regions that need to be spliced out. And so here we have the pre-RNA that has these pink regions here that are uh, introns. And then we have the processing component where we remove these introns. Um, and we also add a five prime cap um, that isn't shown here and a poly A tail. My, I apologize, I'm using a mouse to uh, make my letters here. So they're gonna be pretty rough throughout these lectures. Uh, but there's a poly A tail and a five prime cap, um, and that those help uh, in the actual um, export and translation process. So this mature RNA is then um, moved out of the nucleus, and it will come into contact with a ribosome, which reads that RNA sequence and will add the uh, corresponding amino acids for each codon within that mRNA and we generate a protein. And then the protein, which isn't shown here, will go on to um, post-translation and modifications such as folding. It'll go into a barrel protein or, or something of that nature. Um, and there's a lot of, of things that can happen after the process of translation. As we continue to lay the groundwork for um, our molecular biology and going through these refreshers, we'll talk a bit about uh, the plasma membrane and uh, plasma membranes are, uh, are a phospholipid bilayer. They're composed of two layers of phospholipids. Um, these bilayers are oriented with a hydrophilic group. So hydrophilic meaning water loving, and those are always denoted as, the, as these round uh, heads. And then we have these hydrophobic tails, which are um, fatty acyl chains, um, which are denoted by these lines that are coming off. And so those being hydrophobic want to be away from the water. So when these molecules are uh, in this, uh, this environment, 
they want to put all of their heads that are hydrophilic towards the outside or the water exposed area and they want to put all their hydrophobic tails together to keep them away from the water and as you can see these hydrophobic tails in this orientation are all confined to the center here and not exposed to water in addition uh, there is cholesterol that is generally um, kind of spaced throughout this layer and cholesterol um, has, plays a role in um, maintaining the fluidity of the membrane and, not, and making sure it's not super rigid. Um, we also have these transmembrane uh, proteins because if you are, for example, uh, sodium uh, and a, oh, that's a rough A, and a plus, um, and you need to keep these osmotic gradients or um, have gradients established to move um, against osmosis, um, you need channels for these ions to move across. And so they're not going to get through this general uh, phospholipid bilayer because it's so packed tightly together. So they need these transmembrane proteins to act as ways to move things across this uh, plasma membrane. So let's start talking about the uh, structure of the most basic uh, cells, which are prokaryotes. Um, and they have a very simple structure. So E. coli and other gram-negative bacteria, such as those shown at the top here, uh, are surrounded by two membranes that are separated by a peptidoglycan cell wall and a periplasmic space. Uh, within the cytoplasm, we have the nucleoid, which is the uh, circular DNA chromo chromosome, genomic chromosome, and they also have small circular plasma DNAs, um, such as uh, the F plasmid, which is for uh, the prokaryotic version of sexual reproduction, um, if you want more information on that, look at my genetics lectures. Um, and these are not enclosed in a nuclear membrane, such as in eukaryotic cells. So they're just floating around in the cytoplasm as opposed to being enveloped in a nuclear membrane. So since these cells are so basic, they also have relatively small genome size. So if we look at the eubacteria, um, we have examples such as uh, E. coli, which has 4.64 million base pairs and encodes for about 4,100 proteins. It has one uh, chromosome, one circular chromosome. Um, and E. coli is a bacteria that um, is enteric, so it's prevalent in uh, the human gut. Um, and it's kind of a model organism to investigate um, all sorts of gene regulation um, and membrane transport. We also use it for um, uh, expression of proteins that we want to study um, and for um, cloning genes and things of that nature. And there's some other interesting um, uh, organisms <laughs> that are on this list here. So uh, we have influenza, um, we have Helobacter uh, pylori, which is a uh, bacteria that is often responsible for creating like ulcers in your stomach. Um, and then if we move up the list here, we can see uh, that eukaryotes have generally larger uh, uh, genomes. So we have uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, which has 12.16 million, that's uh, yeast. Um, and then if we move further up into the eukaryotes, um, we have uh, Drosophila, which is the fruit fly, which has 168.74 million base pairs. Um, we have uh, the chicken, which has 1,072 million base pairs. We have mouse, Homo sapiens, and then my personal favorite, Arabidopsis thaliana, which is a plant. It is um, kind of the Drosophila or mouse or E. coli of the plant world. It's the most studied plant, um, which has 135 million. This is what I study in my lab. That's why it's, I'm kind of partial to it. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide because there's a lot of information and it should be review from 
even high school um, or your intro biology classes. But these are the cell uh, organelles or constituents of the cell, um, such as uh, we've been talking a bit about the plasma membrane, but we also have the mitochondria, which were um, formerly bacteria that have entered this endocytosis uh, symbiotic relationship, um, the nuclear envelope, um, so that is the nucleus, the membrane of the nucle nucleus, um, and, uh, smooth and rough ER, uh, etc. So these are things that um, you, if you need a refresher, this is a good slide that tells you what these organelles do. But as I said, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on them because this is all review and it's uh, uh, stuff you've heard before. So uh, pointing out some key characteristics of eukaryotic cells versus prokaryotic cells. So eukaryotes have a nucleus. Um, they also have a prominent uh, endoplasmic reticulum, or, or ER, um, down there. Uh, they have a Golgi complex, um, which are involved in uh, synthesizing and secreting uh, antibodies uh, from the cell. Uh, they have mitochondria, um, which are uh, the powerhouse of the cell, uh, so to speak, um, and also the lysosome. So within eukaryotes, and specifically in this case within mammals, there are three different types of cytoskeletal filaments. And so these filaments are uh, responsible for controlling uh, the structure of the cell, um, motility of cells that move, um, as well as intracellular motility. So moving organelles around, um, moving different proteins around, creating gradients, um, and uh, as well as segregating uh, chromosomes during mitosis. Um, and these three different types are uh, microtubules, right there, and microfilaments, as well as intermediate filaments. And a single cell contain, can contain all three types of these different filaments. And so this cell um, has three different antibodies labeled with different colors. Um, so you can see that um, within this cell, there you can have all three of these uh, structural uh, components. So another type of these microtubules are the cilia, which are extensions of the plasma membrane um, that contain motor proteins that enable them to produce uh, kind of patterns or shape changes and move materials across the surface or prop propel the cell um, via uh, motility allow the cell to kind of swim around, right? And uh, this is an example of the trachea, where you have cilia that form or perform this wave-like pattern where they will move things uh, when you get dust or dirt or whatever else into your lungs. They help to move that out of the lungs back up to the trachea and uh, initiate the coughing reflex to remove things uh, that aren't supposed to be in your lungs that could lead to infection, etc. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, eukaryotic uh, nucleus. So the nucleus is bound by inner outer membranes uh, containing these nuclear pore complexes through which material move in and out of the nucleus. Um, and the nuclear inner membrane is supported by a 2D structural network uh, comprised of uh, laminin intermediate. Uh, proteins, so the lamina, uh, as indicated uh, right there. Uh, and the outer membrane is connected to that uh, ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, um, which is shown right here. The endoplasmic reticulum um, can be studded with ribosomes, which uh, synthesize those proteins, uh, and they secrete the proteins as well. Um, for example, in the, um, in the pancreatic acinar uh, cells, they produce digestive enzymes and secrete them. Um, and also within the nucleus is the nucleolus, which is this uh, center part right here and in the uh, electron micrograph over here, uh, that dark spot. And that's the site of ribosomal RNA production and uh, assembly of the uh, ribosomal uh, components, so the small and large subunits. So obviously within the nucleus, we also have DNA, um, which form these compact structures uh, that we call chromosomes. Uh, you all know this, I'm sure. Um, and these chromosomes uh, 
will form these tightly formed packages um, which aid in their separation during mitosis uh, or meiosis. Um, and these chromosomes undergo semi-conservative uh, DNA replication during the cell cycle's S phase, which duplicates each chromosome, um, and they remain uh, connected through this uh, feature called the centromere. So we have our original copy, we end up with uh, semi-conservative replication. We have two copies that are connected by the centromere. And then during uh, the M phase of mitosis, those spindle fibers will come and connect to the centromere and pull apart those two into the respective daughter cells. So looking at the Golgi complex and the uh, endoplasmic reticulum, um, the ER, or endoplasmic reticulum, uh, is the largest membrane in most cells. It's because it has this very folded, convoluted structure. Um, and the smooth ER uh, synthesizes lipids, while the rough ER um, has ribosomes associated with it. And those ribosomes uh, synthesize um, membrane and secreted proteins. So uh, the ER also undergoes this uh, process called vesicle budding um, and that carries membrane uh, and membrane associated proteins as well as uh, excreted proteins to the Golgi complex uh, where the proteins are then modified via glycosylation. Uh, vesicle budding from the Golgi will carry modified proteins to various destinations including the plasma membrane and to the lysosomes so this is kind of you've probably heard the basic term this is kind of the packaging uh, complex the Golgi complex packages and sends proteins to various uh, different locations throughout the cell um, for their respective uh, function let's continue on talking about the uh, lysosomes so lysosomes contain enzymes that degrade polymers into their uh, monomeric subunits. So nucleases um, such as, uh, or nucleases degrade RNA and DNA into the mononucleotides A, T, G, C, and U. Uh, proteases degrade proteins into their constituent amino acids. And then phosphatases remove phosphate groups from these mononucleotides, phospholipids, and other compounds. Um, <clears throat> there are other enzymes that uh, degrade uh, complex polysaccharides so like sugars as well as uh, glycolipids. So in the process of endocytosis, uh, our marker up here, endocytosis number one here, uh, there's regions in the plasma membrane that contain these transmembrane protein receptors and they will invaginate, uh, which you can see right here, uh, by and form the cytoplasmic uh, coating uh, to form what's called a coated pit. So that invagination is a coated pit. And that pinches off into this coated vesicle, which is right there. Um, the vesicle then uncoats and fuses with an endosome, which is right here, where some of the proteins are sorted into vesicles that fuse back with the plasma membrane. Um, and then others are sorted into vesicles that fuse with the lysosome down here and those get degraded. Now in um, phagocytosis, these large uh, insoluble extracellular uh, materials or uh, complexes it can be, um, they are taken in um, the same way through this endocytosis uh, process and they're delivered to the lysosome for uh, destruction or degra uh, degradation. And then lastly, we have autophagy. And this is um, a very similar process using the lysosome, but this is where intercellular material and damaged organelles, so uh, organelles don't live forever. They get damaged through reactive oxygen species or radiation or things of that nature, uh, or chemical toxic compounds, etc. Well, these components then are uh, delivered to the lysosome as well for degradation. Um, and then new organelles are made to replace them. So let's talk a little bit about plants near and dear to my heart. 
Um, so plant cells generally contain this uh, membrane-limited vacuole, which is this giant uh, empty spot here in the middle of this plant cell. And this vacuole accumulates and stores water for the plant, but it also stores ions and small molecule nutrients like sugars and amino acids and things needed for uh, everyday maintenance of the cell. Um, but it also contains these uh, degradative uh, enzymes that will break down things, uh, X or RNA after it's been transcribed or after it's been translated, excuse me, et cetera. Now let's look at these organelles. Uh, so mitochondria, um, these are those what were formerly bacteria that are in the symbiotic relationship and lost some of their function, et cetera. Um, they have two different membranes. They have an inner membrane and they have an outer membrane. Um, and or, these mitochondria are, are very prolific inside eukaryotic cells. Um, and some uh, cell types, they can occupy up to 25% of the intercellular space. Uh, so there's a lot of them. Um, and so they, these two membranes, the inner and the uh, outer, they differ in their composition as well as their function. So the outer membrane has these large pores that allows molecules to move from the cytosol into the inside of the mitochondria to the inner membrane space, uh, which is the space between the inner and the outer membrane. And then the inner mitochondrial membrane um, there's many of these, uh, what we call cristae, uh, C-R-I-S-T-A-E, uh, these cristae infoldings um, inside the mitochondria that increases the membrane surface area. And this is the site where aerobic respiration and ATP production is performed. And so uh, since the cell requires a lot of respiration and ATP, there needs to be a lot of surface area to provide a an area for that function to occur. So let's briefly go over a, a reminder of the cell cycle. So there are four say, uh, phases to the cell cycle, uh, the G phase, S phase, G2, and the M phase. Um, and the G1 phase, uh, or the gap phase, uh, these cells, uh, all the constituents of the cell are made, uh, everything's good to go and the cells are just increasing in size, and so they're growing. Um, during the next phase, the S phase, um, this is what where the uh, DNA duplication uh, occurs. So we have um, the chromosomes being replicated into sister chromatids. Uh, the G2 phase then uh, is where the cell prepares for uh, the process of mitosis. And then the M phase uh, is where the cell actually performs these uh, chromosome segregations and those spindle fires come in and connect the centri uh, centriole and will pull them apart and the cell will divide into two daughter cells. Um, and the G0 phase, um, which is kind of a subset of the G1 phase, this is a phase where cells are temporarily or permanently out of the cell cycle. So if it's a cell that's kind of at the end of its life or it's finalized and it's no longer going cell division, it'll enter this G0 phase and it won't uh, divide into daughter cells anymore. So as I alluded to earlier, there are a lot of eukaryotic organisms that are used in cell biology and molecular biology that uh, we use as models to understand species that are more evolved or further down the evolutionary tree than them. And um, because it's very difficult to work with humans, um, and especially in developmental biology um, or uh, early development, we use instead these models that have these preserved uh, molecular pathways to try to get an understanding of how not only does it work in that model, but also can we derive that information and apply it to humans. And so there's a lot of information here. I'm not gonna go into every single one, but I'm gonna point out a few things here. Um, for example, uh, yeast um, is a very simple, uh, one of the most simple eukaryotic organisms. Um, and we can look at gene regulation and aging. Um, roundworms or C. elegans, um, we also look at aging, some behavior, um, and also gene regulation. Um, obviously, one of the besides primates, um, the most widely used 
uh, model for humans is mouse. Um, and we can look at behavior, infectious diseases, um, functions of the immune system, um, fruit fly. There's a lot of, um, of maintained or preserved um, developmental genes. So the Hox genes and the homeobox genes. Um, if you've taken my development class, you're probably quite familiar with those. A lot of those studies were first conducted in fruit flies or Drosophila. Um, zebrafish, we also see a lot of uh, uh, vertebrate development. So Drosophila, unfortunately, is an invertebrate. But zebrafish, we can look at development in a vertebrate uh, standpoint. And then, of course, my plant, uh, Arabidopsis, um, we can look a little bit. It's, it's a little more distantly related to humans, but it also has importance in terms of agriculture um, and things of that nature. So this slide is something that would be um, you might want to be somewhat familiar with. You don't have to memorize them, but be familiar with the fact that um, these different models can be used to study things that we can then apply to humans. So looking at these models a little uh, more closely, um, in yeast, yeast is an interesting eukaryote in that it can be haploid or diploid, and it can re reproduce either sexually or asexually. Um, and so uh, these unis uh, it's a unicellular organism, a single cell eukaryote. Um, it's a model organism for studying the activities of these eukaryotic cells, um, but more specifically, mostly used for studying the cell cycle and secretion of uh, proteins or chemical compounds. And so in the diploid uh, cell proliferation stage, um, following a mitotic chromosome duplication and segregation, so the spindle fibers are pulling apart those uh, two sister chromatids, the daughter nucleus, so the newly formed nucleus, is transported into a bud um, and then that bud comes off and forms a new, um, a new yeast cell. In haploid cell mating, um, starvation, so lack of nutrients, causes formation of these haploid spores. So these spores can lie dormant for quite a while. So when uh, you think of um, yeast, baker's yeast and things like that, those are uh, generally dormant uh, yeast that aren't undergoing um, any sort of cellular processes at the time. So these haploid spores uh, will have two mating types um, and they will mate. Uh, so we see here the two mating types uh, denoted by red and blue, and they will mate uh, to form diploid cells. Um, and so th these two different uh, cell cycles are uh, also able to be studied to kind of look at how uh, haploid and diploid organisms uh, reproduce. So another interesting species to study is these plasmodium species, and these are parasites that cause malaria, which are single-celled protozoans, um, and they're similar species such as um, Trypanosoma brucei that cause uh, African sleeping sickness, etc. And so these plasmodium uh, alternatively inhibit mosquitoes, uh, and humans, and they transform their morphology and behavior based on what environment they're in. So in step one, let me get my marker here. Step one, uh, we have these sporozytes that when a mosquito bites a human are injected into the host and they'll migrate to the liver here and they'll develop into these marozytes, uh, which are then uh, released into the bloodstream. And so these marozytes then find uh, red blood cells within the uh, bloodstream and they will invade them. And the plasmodium proteins move to the surface of these inf infected red blood cells. And these blood cells will then adhere to the walls of the blood vesicles, um, preventing them from circulating to the spleen where the immune system would destroy those blood cells. So they have kind of a, a uh, strategy to make sure that they're not destroyed in the spleen. So these merozytes reproduce inside uh, the red blood cells here um, and will burst forth and this causes the infection uh, and the fever and the shaking and the chill symptoms associated uh, with malaria but then they'll also uh, start to infect other blood cells so they'll start to reproduce and increase the symptoms. These merozytes will eventually undergo meiosis um, and develop into male and female or uh, gametophytes 
Um, so here we have the, uh, or sorry, gametocytes, uh, the male and female gametocytes, um, which contain half the uh, usual number of chromosomes. Uh, so they've undergone meiosis and they're only haploid at that point. And then at that point, a mosquito, another mosquito, say an uninfected mosquito, will bite the human and will take in these uh, gametocytes from the plasmodium. And in the mosquito's stomach, those gametocytes are then transformed based on the environment of the stomach into sperm or eggs. Um, and so here we have the transformation in the mosquito. Um, and then once that happens, the sperm will then go and fuse with the egg and create a zygote. Uh, so we're starting the life cycle here. And then that zygote will implant into the stomach wall and grow into uh, oocysts. Um, and these oocysts will produce more of those sporozytes. And those sporozytes will then migrate to the salivary glands of the mosquito. And then that mosquito will go on to bite another human, inject the sporocytes into the next human, and the cycle continues. So this goes over and over and over again. That's why uh, these mosquitoes or tsetse flies in the case of uh, trypanosomes will infect and spread this disease to humans. So all organs in higher eukaryotes are an arrangement of various tissues. Um, and so here we have a cross section of a small artery or an atrial. And as you can see here, we have a vessel lumen, uh, which is the uh, inside. You can see the blood cells inside this lumen as they pass through. Um, and this lumen is lined by a sheet of endothelial cells or endothelium, um, which is this layer right here. Uh, Overlying that endothelium tissue is this smooth muscle, and the smooth muscle is there to uh, either relax or constrict the blood vessels. So when you get cold uh, in your extremities, you constrict the blood flow to your extremities to um, keep a higher core body temperature. Um, and if you're hot, your blood ves uh, vessels expand to help dissipate heat. And then surrounding that connective tissue or surrounding that smooth muscle is connective tissue. And connective tissue just will, um, is kind of the glue that uh, will attach that blood vessel to other tissues. So when we talk about models for humans, uh, the closer the organism is on the evolutionary tree, the better the model. And so here we have kind of a zoomed in version of that tree of life that we saw earlier, where we can see that um, the how closely related or how long ago these branches on the evolutionary tree were generated. And so bonobo and chimpanzee are the two closest related species to humans. Um, as you can see here, uh, humans and bonobo are closest on the tree. And then the next closest related to humans are gorilla, then orangutans, then gibbon, and then uh, rhesus macaques. And so um, when you hear a lot of like clinical trials and things like that for drugs, eventually they get to the point where they work with primates because if we wanna see how they're going to perform in humans, the best thing to do would be to look at the closest related species to us. However, a lot of mammalian uh, organisms have close relation to us, not as close as monkeys, um, as you know, you hear the difference between humans and uh, a chimp is, you know, 90, I hear different numbers all the time, 97 to 99% uh, DNA similarity. But as you can see, if we were to compare uh, the chromosome uh, 14 of a human and chromosome 12 of a mouse, these lines uh, indicate regions of DNA that are conserved between humans and mice. And as you can see, not only are there a bunch of conserved regions, but also the order along the chromosome is conserved. There's no lines on this chromosome that are crossing over, indicating a, a chromosomal inversion or anything of that nature. And so there's a lot of similarities still between humans and mice.
this conservation between mice and humans is the most evident in development. And so the first few stages, uh, cell stages and divisions during development are very similar between mice and humans. And so the embryonic body plan is determined by a program of genes that specify the pattern of the body. Uh, these are the homeobox genes or uh, the um, homeotic genes. Um, and in addition, there's these local cell interactions with paracrine factors and juxtacrine factors and things that you may remember if you did take my development class um, that help to determine these early patternings. And it's not until much later that you start to see a lot of differentiation between the development of mice and of humans. So as you can see, these conserved genes for development are preserved in a lot of species even far further related uh, than mice. And so um, this Urbilatera is the common ancestor of both mammals and flies that occurred about 600 million years ago. And at this point, the developmental genes, the homeobox genes and the Hox genes, um, were first evolved and conserved all the way from mice to human. And so the spatial patterning of the genes along the chromosome is conserved between the two species and also where on the anterior posterior axis that these genes are expressed is conserved. So the same genes that make up uh, the kind of mouth structure of the fly are also present very anteriorly at the top of the neck of a um, mammalian uh, organism. In addition, the cells at the very posterior end of the fly are also present in the posterior axis of the mammal. And so a lot of, the, because these genes are so highly conserved, we can use these uh, fruit flies as models to try to better understand the genes controlling development in both fruit flies and in mammals. An example of these homologous genes between flies and humans are genes that control eye development. So uh, a lot of the genes in Drosophila are named for their phenotype, so for their physical trait. So the gene called Eyeless in Drosophila and the gene called Pax6 in humans encode this homologous uh, uh, protein which have similar developmental functions. And so Drosophila Eyeless mutation causes the lack of compound eye development. So as you can see here, uh, the one on the left is wild type and the one on the right is the eyeless mutant. And then in humans that have uh, a Pax6 mutation, you have the lack of iris development compared to uh, a wild type uh, Pax6 human.